Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath in, let it out slowly, and off we go. Tonight, let's return to one of the strangest books ever read on this podcast, Sim's Theory of Concentric Spheres, demonstrating that the Earth is hollow, habitable within, and widely open about the poles. Written by a citizen of the United States and published in 1826 by Morgan Lodge and Fisher, Cincinnati, Ohio. Let's pick up where we left off. Chapter 3 Sim's Theory Supported by Arguments Drawn from the Principles Inherent in Matter and the Consequences Resulting from Motion Tending to Show that, from Necessity, Matter must form itself into concentric circles or spheres, such as Sims describes the Earth to be composed of. It is a principle laid down by Sir Isaac Newton, the correctness of which is generally admitted, that matter attracts matter in proportion to its quantity and the squares of its distances inversely, Captain Sims contends that gravity consists in a certain expansive quality in the molecules which constitute the aerial fluid called ether, which fills universal space, and creates a pushing instead of a pulling power. However, let either be correct. I conceive it cannot materially affect the principles necessary to constitute concentric spheres. Either principle, I apprehend, would lead us nearly to the same results. When matter was in chaos, or in a form not solid, promiscuously disseminated through universal space, suppose it then should at once receive the impression of those universal laws by which it is governed, and see what would be the consequence. According to Sir Isaac Newton's Principles of Gravity, the particle of matter that happened to be the largest would attract the smaller in its neighborhood, which would increase the power of attraction in proportion to the increase of matter until all in the universe would be collected into one vast body in the center of space and there remain motionless and at rest forever. This, however, we find not to be the case, for innumerable bodies of matter, differing in magnitude, are known to exist throughout the universe, arranged at suitable distances from each other, and performing certain revolutions in obedience to certain fixed laws impressed on them. Now suppose all the matter in our globe to be an extended liquid mass, the particles so disengaged from each other as to take their positions according to the established laws of matter, and then see what would be the consequences resulting from motion and gravity. Taking the laws of Newton for our guide, the particles of matter in the center would be operated on by the power of gravity equally on all sides and consequently be stationary. Suppose, then, a line struck through this globe of matter so as to make a globe of half the diameter of the hole in the center. It is plain that the inner globe would not contain more than one-eighth part as much matter as the surrounding one, Hence, it would be attracted towards the surface more than to the center, were it not for the attraction of the matter on the opposite side, exerting an influence upon it. 
but this being removed to so much greater distance would not be more than an equipoise to the other. The diameter of our globe, according to the best observation, is believed to be about 7,970 English miles, and its circumference 25,038 miles. Consequently, if it were solid, it would contain 265 billion 78,559,622 cubic miles of matter, while a globe of only half the diameter would contain only 33,134,819,952. Suppose our globe divided into parts of one square mile on the surface, bounded by straight lines converging to a point at the center, as the subjoined figure represents. And then suppose there were no other particles of matter in the universe but A and B, A containing 1,328 cubic miles of matter, and B only 166. A would attract B, so as to make their center of attraction at point O, which point would become at once the common center. But admitting the whole matter of the globe to exist, A would still exert its influence on B, but both would be operated upon by sections T and S and the surrounding matter, all perhaps tending to one common center. However, I imagine that the tending to the center would not be so great as is contended for by the generally received theory, which alleges that matter at the center of the earth is four times as hard as hammered iron. The Newtonian philosophy appears to contemplate a globe at rest, and not in such rapid motion as we know the earth and other planetary bodies to be in, communicating to them a centrifugal force which tends to throw matter from the center. The rotary motion of each planet is no doubt regulated by the quantity of matter it contains, so that at its surface, centrifugal and centripetal forces are equally balanced the rotary motion being adequate to communicate a force to counterbalance the force of gravity. Newton ascertained by his investigations of the properties and principles of matter, the earth to be a globe flattened at the poles, and the French philosophers afterwards confirmed this fact by measuring a degree in different latitudes. This difference between the equatorial and polar diameters of the Earth and of the other planets, which are also known to be of that shape, is ascribed by those philosophers who attempt to account for such a formation to the projectile force of the globe at the equator occasioned by its rotary motion. This is admitting that the matter of our globe was once in so soft a state as to take its form from motion, for were the earth a compact, solid body, and four times as hard as hammered iron at the center, as the Newtonian system alleges. This rotary motion round an imaginary axis could never give to the globe the form of an oblate spheroid as is ascertained to be the fact. Because a hard, solid body moving in empty space could not be supposed to yield into that shape by any law of action as yet unfolded by science. But were the matter of this globe thrown into a confused, disorganized state, and then put into a quick rotary motion, such as it is known to have, it would throw off from the center towards the surface, first the heaviest, 
and next the lighter substances, which is the very order in which they are found to be arranged in the composition of the earth. This principle, for it is simply the principle of projectile force, will account for mountains, hills, valleys, plains, and for nearly all the inequalities on the face of the earth. These circumstances depend on the density of substances composing the earth. Substances of the greatest specific gravity are susceptible of the greatest projectile force, and hence we find that mountains are composed of heavy masses of rock, mineral substances, and heavy earths. Hills, or the next highest eminences, of earth of the next specific gravity, and plains or level lands of lighter substances. Had the earth originally been composed of one uniform substance, sand, for example, of equal fineness and weight, the whole surface of the globe would have presented one uniform level or unbroken plane. But presuming that it was originally composed of, at least, earths of different densities, the heaviest masses would be first thrown out and raised their heads above the surface of the ocean. Thus, islands would be formed, and clusters of islands would form continents, rearing their lofty heads into the air, and if the substances of which they were originally composed were not as hard as the rocks which we now find on them, the sun and changing temperature of the climates might convert certain kinds of earth into masses of stone, increasing in specific gravity by petrifaction and other causes until the towering peaks of the Alps and Andes assumed their present solid form. One continent having thus emerged, another would naturally be produced simultaneously on the opposite side of the sphere, as an equipoise to the first, to keep equal the Earth's motion. Until all the heavy substances should be thrown out, and united in a compact sphere. To an observer of the earth, the crust everywhere appears to indicate the emergence of land from water. Almost the whole surface of the solid crust is alluvial, and by reasoning and reflecting, we are led to the conclusion that the solid parts of our globe are nothing more than a crust and formed into concentric spheres, in accordance with the principles of projectile force. I would ask, what proofs have we, that the sphere we inhabit is solid beyond the degree of thickness necessary to preserve it from injury by its rapid motion round the sun, by its diurnal motion round its own axis, and by its motion round its common center of gravity with the moon. It has been ascertained with mathematical certainty that the large planet Jupiter is more than 1,300 times the bulk of the Earth, and Saturn, independent of its double ring, is about 1,000 times the size. If we apply to those prodigious bodies the reasoning of Newton relative to plastic forms moving variously, there is no just grounds for concluding that they are solid substances to their centers. If they were, their vast weight and remote position would require much more attraction than probably even the sun could furnish to keep them within their orbits. The acknowledged and received laws of gravity, together with the measurements made on the same meridian in different latitudes, have demonstrated to us that the greatest mathematicians have been mistaken as to the real figure of the earth. 
It is for schoolmen to make exact calculations respecting the force of gravity and centrifugal and centripetal forces. It is for them to determine with mathematical certainty where matter, left to its own laws, would settle. For such undertakings, I acknowledge my incompetency, but I have long had strong doubts whether the laws of gravity are well understood, or whether the rules on which these calculations could be accurately made are exactly known. However, I take the broad principles of nature as presented to my view for my guide, and draw my conclusions from what I have seen or what is well known to exist. Observe the boy hurling a stone from a sling. He whirls it round his head for a minute to acquire a certain degree of centrifugal force, and although it is not whirled with half the velocity the earth revolves on its axis, yet as soon as it is released from confinement, notwithstanding the whole power of the earth is operating on it with all the force of gravity, the centrifugal force which the stone acquired by the whirling is sufficient to carry it off at a tangent to the circle described by the sling for a very considerable distance before the gravity of the earth and atmospheric obstruction can force it to the ground. If you will take the trouble to examine a mechanic grinding cutlery on a large stone that is smooth on the sides, and has a quick motion. You may observe that if a certain portion of water be poured on the perpendicular side whilst the stone is turning, it does not settle or form itself into a body round the crank or axis, nor does the gravity of the earth draw it from the surface, but forms itself on the side of the stone into something resembling concentric circles one within another. The surface of the earth, I apprehend, revolves with much greater velocity than any grindstone, and the substances composing the spheres are much firmer than water. Most of us, I presume, have seen persons for amusement in displaying feats of dexterity place a full glass of wine or water on a hoop, and whirl it round their heads without spilling one drop. The centrifugal force it acquires by the revolutions overcomes the power of gravity, although nothing appears to support it but the common atmosphere. Another experiment producing a similar effect might be made with a cup filled with fine sand. On the surface of the sand, describe a circle nearly in the center. It will then be apparent, on observing the cup, that the sand within the circle, provided the particles attract one another as the planets do, is as much attracted towards one verge of the cup as the other owing to its being equally surrounded by matter or sand, and therefore it can be but very little, if any, gravitated center-wise. Hence, being in a degree suspended, only a small horizontal rotary motion is required to whirl it towards the rim or sides of the cup into a circular form. And hence it follows that those particles of sand lying equidistant from the inner side of the circle of sand thus formed, and the outer side would be in like manner balanced or supported by being equally gravitated in both directions. A disposition would thus be produced to form into concentric circles, and it would therefore follow that successive similar dispositions to subdivision should occur, gradually lessening in force and quantity. This principle applied to the Earth or other planets 
would cause them to be formed into concentric spheres and would throw the matter from the axis as well at the poles as at the center and thereby constitute open poles. Another simple experiment might also be made to illustrate that a disposition to concentric spheres does exist in nature. On a piece of paper, sift a small quantity of very fine magnetic particles, such as steel or iron filings, under which hold a lodestone, and you will observe that the attractive power of the magnet will cause the filings on the paper to arrange themselves into various concentric circles, nearly regular and equidistant from each other. From what cause should this take place, rather than that the filings should be accumulated into one mass? Various have been the conjectures relative to the cause and origin of the meteoric stones or fireballs, which have been known to fall to the earth in all ages and in various parts of the world. Some have imagined them to be precipitated from a comet or some of the planets, others that they come from the moon, and Captain Sims's opinion, I believe, is that they are formed isolated in space by spontaneous accumulations, as by attracting molecules of matter at first in a fluid state, which afterwards solidifies by heat or motion. But come from whence they may, they are said to be constituted of a substance unknown to our geologists, and in several instances the fragments have been ascertained to consist of pieces, some of which have concave and some convex surfaces, affording a certain proof that previous to their descent they had been constituted of hollow spheres. Professor Silliman of Yale College has preserved some of the fragments of one of these fireballs, and in his valuable journal has given the public an able description of the facts which occurred when they fell. This fireball fell in the state of Connecticut in the year 1807, producing three distinct reports like a cannon, making three convulsive leaps or throws in its course, which were simultaneous, no doubt, with the explosions, becoming less luminous after each, and being quite extinguished at the third. Three showers of stones fell to the earth in a line with its course. The second shower fell five miles distant from the first, and the last three or four miles from the second. Some of the fragments were found to be concave, others convex, and especially on those sides of the fragments which were glazed with sooty, crusted surface, as if vitrified. These phenomena are precisely such as would occur, supposing the fireball to have been a small satellite or erratic planet, at first fluid, which had become so condensed by the increased action of terrestrial gravity occasioned by its sudden approach as to cause its fluid parts to crystallize and form into at least three concentric spheres, and the latent heat and light set free by such rapid condensation as to produce the meteoric flame which in this case was almost equal in light to that of the sun at midday. As soon as the spheres became sufficiently solidified to prevent the heated aerial fluid contained in the mid-plane cavities of the spheres from passing out with freedom when expanded by the heat or let the atmospheric air pass in in case a condensation within afforded a vacuum, the solid crusts of the spheres would be disruptured successively one after the other, lose their regular rotation, 
and fall in fragments to the earth. The fall of this body is not a solitary instance of the kind. Others have fallen in many parts of the earth, attended with phenomena more or less the same. On the 16th of January, 1818, in Florida near Mobile Bay, a fireball bursted with a considerable report. Immediately before the explosion, it was observed to project a cone of fire from each pole horizontally and at right angles with its course. Its bursting like a bombshell indicated that it must have been hollow, and the two cones of light which appeared beside its train showed that it was open at the poles. Turn your attention to the general economy of nature throughout her works, and you will perceive in various and almost innumerable substances that she forms hollow cylinders or spheres in the room of solid ones. Inquire of the botanist, and he will tell you that the plants which spring up spontaneously, agreeable to the established laws of nature, are hollow cylinders. If a hollow globe would answer the ends of supporting organic life as well as a solid one, why not be hollow as well as a stalk of wheat? Or by what laws is the stalk of wheat governed that it should always grow hollow? What law in nature causes the quills and feathers of a bird to be hollow cylinders. Why are they not solid? I presume it is for this plain reason that nature, throughout all her works, has wisely assigned to everything just matter enough for strength and usefulness, and has in no case overburdened it with unnecessary and cumbrous weight. Inquire of the anatomist, and he will tell you that the large bones of all animals are hollow, and particularly that the bones of birds are more than ordinarily so. Even the minutest hairs of our heads are hollow. Go to the mineralist, and he will inform you that the stone called aerolites and many other mineral bodies are composed of hollow concentric circles, and that strata of different kinds abound in various mineral substances. Even the earth itself is composed, as geologists tell us, of various strata, composed of different substances, and varying from one degree of density to another. If every part of our globe be regulated according to the received laws of gravity and the relative density of matter, why do we find almost all over the world light alluvial soil in the valleys and plains, and on the tops of the highest mountains the more heavy granite and some of the heaviest substances that nature knows we can hardly indulge the thought that all this is the work of volcanic eruptions or some dread throw of nature. However, if we direct our attention alone to those general laws which are known and which are believed to govern matter, I apprehend it would be very difficult to account for the creation of worlds and the admirable arrangement which subsists throughout the universe. To account for everything, either according to the old or new theory, would be attempting too much. It would be placing the deity in some corner of the universe an idle spectator, whilst matter governed by its own laws was forming itself into worlds and systems the bare thought of which is irreverent. Is the existence of matter owing to some other first cause? Or did matter create itself and impress upon itself the laws which govern it? 
Such an idea is absurd. We might as well imagine that matter created God as itself. By attempting to trace every effect to some natural cause, is attempting to do more than we shall ever be able to accomplish. Such a course of reasoning must lead us to the conclusion that there is no God, or first cause, or at least to what would be nearly the same thing, that there is no need of one. But in reasoning upon this subject, I take it for granted that there is a God, and that he is the first cause of all things, the creator of all the orbs in the universe, be they either solid globes or concentric spheres. And I hope such is the reader's belief, and I cannot discover in this anything derogatory from his infinite power, wisdom, or divine economy in the formation of a hollow world and concentric spheres any more than in that of solid ones. I should rather be of the opinion that a construction of all the orbs in creation on a plan corresponding with Sims's theory would display the highest possible degree of perfection, wisdom, and goodness, the most perfect system of creative economy, and as Dr. Mitchell expresses it, a great saving of stuff. Chapter 4 Arguments in Support of Sims's Theory Drawn from Celestial Appearances That a disposition to hollow cylinders does exist in nature, I think must be admitted, and that a similar principle exists in the planetary system, at least in some degree, appears to me as certain. Every person has seen or heard of Saturn and his rings. At certain periods of time, the appearance of this planet, viewed through a good telescope, represents him to be surrounded with two luminous rings, or bodies of matter, concentric with each other, and with the body of the planet. These rings nowhere adhere to the body of the planet, but are distinct and separate, some considerable distance from him and from each other, leaving a portion of vacant space between the planet and the rings, through which we see the fixed stars beyond. It is a fact, I believe, admitted by all, and of which we have positive ocular demonstration, that these rings are constituted of some kind of matter, if not solid, at least to all appearance as much so as the body of the planet. Their thickness must be very inconsiderable, for when the edge is turned to the eye, it is no longer visible, except to the powerful reflecting telescope of Dr. Herschel. Thus, the rings undergo phases according to the position of the planet in his orbit, which prove them to be opaque, like other bodies in the planetary system, and like them shining by reflection. I am not informed what is the precise velocity of the rotary motion of the rings. Probably their varying aspect, or some other cause, has prevented a correct observation from being made. However, the planet itself revolves on its axis with an astonishing velocity, and no doubt the rings also, though perhaps with different degrees of velocity. The appearance of Saturn, I conceive, establishes the fact that the principle of concentric spheres or hollow planets does exist, at least in one instance in the solar system. And if the fact be established that it exists in one case, is it not fair, nay, is it not almost a certain and necessary consequence, that the same laws of matter which formed one planet into concentric spheres must form all the others 
on a plan more or less the same. If we draw any conclusion or form any opinion at all respecting the formation of the planets whose inner parts we cannot see, or if we form any opinion in relation to our own planet in particular, whose poles have never been explored, would not reasoning from analogy bring us to the conclusion that all bodies of matter are formed similar to that of Saturn, unless we have positive proof to the contrary. But it is not in Saturn alone that we find proof of the principles contended for by Captain Sims. Most, if not all, of the other planets belonging to our system whose relative situation afford us an opportunity of observation, appear to exhibit strong proofs that the same principles prevail throughout. The planet Mars exhibits concentric circles round one or the other of its poles, according as either is more or less in opposition to us. These circles appear alternately light and dark, exactly as they should, supposing the planet to be constituted of concentric spheres, such as Sims believes of the Earth, the light being reflected from their verges on which it falls, and in which case the vacant space between the spheres would necessarily appear dark. Sometimes he appears to us with a single ring at each pole. At such times his axis is at right angles, or nearly so, with a line drawn from the earth to his center. This, I conceive, can be accounted for by the great refraction occasioned by the increased density of his atmosphere around the poles which appears to throw out the further sides of the verges so as to make them appear like rings in the form they present themselves to our view. That such is the natural appearance may be evidenced by taking a small wooden sphere with open poles and immerse it in a circular glass vessel filled with water. With the plane of the openings at a right angle with the visual ray, the refraction occasioned by the water, answering to the dense atmosphere of Mars, will apparently throw out the polar openings, and present you with a view similar to the appearance of Mars when his axis is at right angles to us. Our next neighbor, Venus, between us and the sun, though her being between us and the sun prevents us from having so favorable an opportunity of examining her poles as those of Mars, who is our next neighbor on the side opposite the sun, presents appearances at certain times which seem to lead to the conclusion that she also is constituted of concentric spheres. At times, when this planet is nearly a crescent, we are able to discover a deficient space near the tip of one of her horns. Admitting Venus to be constituted of concentric spheres with open poles, and supposing one of the vacant spaces between two of her spheres about the polar openings to traverse her horn or cusp, at the place where the dark space occurs, it would present to us exactly such an appearance as does actually occur. At other times, one of the horns or cusps of Venus is seen to wind inward, as it were, into the body of the planets, extending about 15 degrees further than the other horn. This is an appearance which would also be presented if Venus is formed according to Sims's theory. And again, supposing one of her horns to terminate round the verge of a polar opening in such way as to follow the curve of the verge for some distance, which is, of course, more curved than the periphery of the planet, 
and the same appearances I think would occur. The axis of the planet not being at right angles with the polar opening, in its revolutions one side of the verge would be thrown much nearer to us than the other, and the different spheres revolving on their axes with different velocities would at different times exhibit to our view the verge of a different sphere. The axis of the planet Jupiter is always at right angles with a line drawn to the Earth. Consequently, his poles are never presented to us, but his belts, which we can and do see, seem to speak loudly in favor of a plurality of spheres. The most common appearance of Jupiter is that he is surrounded by four belts, two bright and two dark, alternate to each other, but they are variable, presenting different appearances. At some times, seven or eight belts are discoverable. At other times, they appear interrupted in their length, and to increase and diminish alternately, running into each other, and again to separate into a number of belts of a smaller size. If Jupiter be a solid globe, I would inquire how is it possible to account for those various changes in his belts, or even for their existence at all. Astronomers, I understand, have heretofore considered the phenomena of Jupiter's belts as altogether unaccountable. If he be a simple plain globe, those belts could not exist. Or if they did, they must forever remain uniform and not change their size and shape or relative positions in respect to each other. Neither could the spots on one belt rotate faster than those on another. But if we adopt the doctrine of concentric spheres and that this planet is composed of a number of them, we can account for all the various appearances in a rational manner. The belts would be produced by the shadow cast on the space between the polar opening of one sphere and the adjoining one. That is, a portion of the sunshine would be reflected from the verges of the spheres on which it fell, and another portion would appear to be swallowed by the intervening space. And if refraction bends the rays of vision between and under his spheres, as it bends a portion of the rays of the sun, so as to produce the apparent belts of comparative shade, then a very complete solution of those appearances, heretofore considered wonderful, would be afforded. The variation which has been observed in their number, shape, and dimensions can in no way be better accounted for than by concluding the planet to be constituted of a number of concentric spheres of different breadths, revolving on different axes and with different velocities, so as sometimes to present to our view the verge of one sphere and sometimes that of another, and the rays of the sun falling on the parts of the verges presented to us would occasion the diversified appearances which we discover. If some sections of both crusts of the spheres be formed of water alone and become occasionally transparent, it will afford an additional reason for the varying phenomena attendant on these appearances, which may also be increased by alternate regions of water, ice, dry land, and snow. Modern astronomers have long noticed the spots frequently visible on the sun. They are described as having the appearance of vast holes or fractures in his outer surface or crust, through which an inner appears to be seen. This also seems to favor the doctrine of different spheres. 
Notwithstanding, the sun revolves very slowly on his axis, it is probable that his poles are open to a greater or less extent. But we can never see into them, owing perhaps to the earth, never being very far from the plane of the sun's equator, his being such a vast deal larger than the earth, and the atmosphere surrounding him so extremely luminous. Very little doubt exists in my mind that the poles of the sun and of Jupiter would appear somewhat like those of Mars or the rings of Saturn, were it not that the two former never present their axes in any perceptible degree towards us. Neither does our satellite, the moon, ever present either of her poles to us. Hence, though this may be in some degree open, notwithstanding her slow rotation, owing to her axis always being nearly at right angles with a line drawn to the earth, we are not able to see whether they are open or not, more especially as her atmosphere is so light and rare as not to produce much refraction. The vast, round, deep caverns observable on the surface of the moon appear as if they might once have been polar openings. If so, she must frequently have changed her axis. The spots of light which have at different periods been discovered by astronomers on the surface of the moon near her poles, when she was on the face of the sun, in an eclipse of that luminary are perhaps best accounted for by supposing the sun to shine in, either at one of her polar openings, or through a cavity on her further side, and appearing to us through one of her annular cavities on this side and near her poles. Or, the sun being much larger than the moon, and the axis of the moon a little varied from right angles with the earth, or perhaps the low side of the sphere being next to the earth, the sun would shine through an annular cavity or open pole, so as to appear to us as a spot of light on the moon's disk. The foregoing enumerated astronomical phenomena are some of the facts tending to confirm and elucidate Sims's theory. They all have been long known to exist, yet I have never heard them accounted for to the satisfaction of my mind. Indeed, I believe some of them never was attempted to be accounted for in any manner whatever. I would therefore request the reader, who may deign to give the subject a serious thought, to reflect that if all the celestial orbs are entire round globes, as the old theory considers them to be, on what principles, or in what manner, could they present the various appearances which I have enumerated? Why should the horns of Venus assume different shapes? What would make the appearance of belts on Jupiter? or rings and concentric circles at the poles of Mars? And finally, in what position could a round, solid globe be placed to exhibit the rings of Saturn revolving with different velocities as it respects each other, and spaces appearing between them and the body of the planet through which stars, millions of miles beyond, can be distinctly seen. These are phenomena I should like to hear explained. On the principle of concentric spheres, they can all be accounted for in a most satisfactory manner. They appear perfectly plain and intelligible. What was thought to be involved in inexplicable mystery and midnight darkness now perfectly accords with the established laws of nature and can be understood by the most ordinary capacity.
And with that very sure and confident end to Chapter 4, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Sim's theory of concentric spheres, demonstrating that the Earth is hollow, habitable within, and widely open about the poles. What a fascinating look at the way our minds work to make sense of a very complex universe. If you'd like to read this fascinating work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod or drop me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. I always love hearing from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.